Welcome to the Rare Faith Podcast, where the solution to every problem is only an idea away, and where the same activity with just a little more awareness always yields better results. Award-winning, best-selling author, Leslie Householder, brings some of her best information to this inspiring series of life-changing episodes that you won't want to miss. Show notes for this episode can be found at ararekindoffaith.com. Welcome, everybody. I know we have several hundred people register for this call, so we're going to get started. We're going to be on time. I'm going to do my best to end on time and get you out of here within the hour. Uh, welcome to it's How to Profit from Your Losses class. My name is Leslie Householder. I welcome you. I'm glad you've joined us. We are going to cover a lot of things tonight. We're going to go really quickly. The reason I do what I do, and this may be important for you to know as we get started, is because I've had my fair share of setbacks. And for the first 10 years of my marriage especially, I threw all of my heart, soul, and energy into fighting those setbacks and trying to avoid them in, in a way that only created more. And so I just wanted to kind of share with you some of the things I've learned over the years, some things that have really made a huge difference in our life. We've gone from being broke and destitute to the point where I was in a depression that got me to where I called the police on a kid who broke my broom. You know, you don't do that unless you are stretched so thin and pressed so hard that you snap, and that's that was my life. And it's a wonder that my husband has stayed with me for so long all these years and seen me grow and come through those things. Now, I don't know how much of my story I'll get to. I don't want to get off on tangents too much. I will share enough to help drive home some of the points that I want to make. But I have learned that some setbacks are necessary for our development. But whenever I face a serious setback, the reason for it can typically be lumped into one of the following three categories. And before we really, really get underway, I think it would be a good idea if you could grab yourself a pen or a pencil and something to write on and come back. You won't miss too much before we get into the meat. But I do want to make sure that you have something to write with because a lot of this particular class requires a visual aid. These three categories that setbacks can be lumped into come from the reason that they happen. There is a reason for everything, I believe. I don't think anything is is truly random. I don't think anything is truly pointless. There were many, many times where I thought my setbacks and my challenges were pointless. I thought, okay, what's the point of my car not starting today? This is so inconvenient. I can't deal with this right now. Or what is the point of that person cut me off the way they did? Or what is the point of me not being able to find my wallet on a deadline? You know, these kinds of things can just cause you to get so uptight and so frustrated that from there forward, you end up stubbing your toe, you end up bumping your head, and just things go downhill from there. And I'm not just talking about trivial things. I'm also talking about the major, major setbacks, the things where somebody gets in a major accident and it creates some debilitating circumstance in their life. That's a major setback. And it's easy to think that those are pointless too. But the way we respond to our setbacks has everything to do with what more setbacks may be avoided or may come our way. So whatever it is today that you're facing, I'd like to, number one, help you turn it around and make it something that you can profit from. But I'd also like to help you see it in a way and respond to it in a way that helps you avoid other challenges and setbacks that aren't the necessary kind. Like I said, some are necessary for our development. Others can be avoided, and so we're going to do our best to avoid the ones that we don't have to go through. There's plenty of setbacks and challenges that we'll face even without those, so let's keep it simple. Number one, the first category. I'd face a challenge or a setback because I accidentally violated one or more of the natural universal laws that govern success. Now, for many, many years, I didn't know there was such a thing. I remember... At one point, when things were especially, especially difficult, this was during the 1990s in California when a recession had just hit our area there. There was an army base that was closed, and the whole community was affected by it, and we moved in right after this happened. But I remember thinking at that point, we'd face another financial challenge, and I would stop, and my eyes would get wide, and I'd say, what am I supposed to think about this? You just tell me how I'm supposed to think about this, and I know everything will work out fine. Now, I don't know what it was inside of me that instinctively knew that 
my thoughts would have some bearing on our future success. But something told me that if I could just think right about this challenge, everything would be okay. Maybe it was just naive hope that that's all I'd have to do is think right about it and it would turn out okay. But really it is more than that. There are laws that govern our success. And if we're in violation of them, no matter how hard we try, no matter how many phone calls we make if we're a salesman, no matter how many books we read, no matter what we do, we will not succeed the way we want to. The second category of challenges fall into where I intentionally violated one or more of the natural universal laws of success. Now, what I mean by this is to be in harmony with the laws of success or the universal laws of nature is to go with the flow of things to be grateful for things, to be accepting of what is and making the most of it. It's not what happens to us. It's what we do with what happens to us. And so, you know, I can think back to a time just last week. You know, this has never been included in one of my classes because it only happened to me about a week ago. But I was in a bad state. I was having a bad day, bad mood. One of these, I don't know why I'm so upset about everything. i just kind of out of control for a little while. And I had a friend a little while later remind me that, yeah, it happens to her about once a month. And I realized, you know, probably what it was. And that's probably too much information for you, but it's reality. So I was having a bad day, and I was irritated at everything. I was annoyed by my dog. And I had told my children that this dog, as much as we love him and as long as we've had him, they need to take more responsibility in keeping up with his messes. And that wasn't happening. And on this day, it was one of those last straws for me. And so I told my son, okay, I'm going to put another ad in the paper. And he looked at me like I had just stabbed him in the heart. And I looked at him like this was the deal. We had made a family agreement that if the children would keep up on these things, we wouldn't need to find a better home for him that cared for him better. And he just was dumbfounded. He couldn't believe that I would even consider such a thing. And he was so upset, he ran out the door. He's a teenager, and he ran out the door, and he decided he needed to get away from angry mother. And I was in such a bad place that I didn't care. You know, I was just in one of these moods. And again, this is probably more information than you wanted to know about Leslie Householder, but there is a story to what happened. I didn't find this out until a few days later. Well, I knew that I was violating these laws of thought. I knew that my bad mood was creating a situation in my life that I was going to regret. And yet I was not in control of that in that moment. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have to get through this and hopefully my family will forgive me again when I'm on the other side of it. Well, I find out later that my other son, who was younger, about 10 years old, was coming home from the park on his bike and he had caught his pant leg in the chain. And it was caught so deeply that he couldn't get it out. And he was actually in a part of our neighborhood that is out of the way. We never go there. We never have any reason to go there, but it's a route that he decided to take on the way home from the park. And he was stuck with this chain on his pant leg. Well, my son, who was 14 and had stormed out of the house because I was violating the laws of thought, he went on a bike ride just to just to get some fresh air. And he wandered and ended up over there on that part of the neighborhood and was able to help my 10-year-old undo his pant leg, and he got himself home. And, you know, I think back to that, and I'm not proud of the way I behaved. I'm not proud of the way I spoke about our poor dog. But I can see that God, and I believe in God, I believe that God orchestrates things to help us even turning lemons into lemonade. He can use my bad day to benefit my 10-year-old son who is stuck on the other side of the neighborhood. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that he can turn those setbacks that we have where we intentionally or, or, or maybe out of control violate one of the natural laws governing success, but that it can benefit someone else too. And the reason I tell you that is because if you're looking at a setback you're facing right now and if you see it as something that maybe happened because of something you did that you're not proud of, I want you to take peace in that. I want you to turn it over to God and say, can you make something good out of this? And then get busy thinking right on purpose, setting goals, starting over, and moving towards another 
results that you want. Let me get on to the third category that our setbacks can be lumped into, and that is setbacks show up when you are solidly on track for accomplishing something amazing and meaningful. I'm going to repeat that. Setbacks show up as a result of being solidly on track for accomplishing something amazing and meaningful. Not all setbacks come because of a violation of law. In fact, I would tend to propose that most setbacks, for a person who is like you, interested in success and overcoming your challenges and prospering your family, for a person like you, I would suggest that every setback is in your life because of the intention you have for success. And let me explain why. First of all, knowing about the laws of success help you avoid unnecessary setbacks, just like knowing about gravity can help you avoid broken bones. And in order to do this, we need to learn about two things. We need to learn about the laws, and then we also need to learn about ourselves and how our thoughts relate with those laws and how they work together. We're not going to have time to go over both sections of that. So on the laws, I'll tell you at the end how to get a free download to help you know more about what those are. But today I want to focus on learning about yourself. Now, just a rundown a little bit more about my story in case you don't know me, if you haven't heard my story yet. I will also direct you to a website that gives you the whole story later since we won't have time to go into it. But my husband and I decided when we first married that we wanted to allow me to stay home with the kids when they came so that I could raise them and we wouldn't have to do the daycare thing. And that was what we decided we wanted. We also wanted to find some way where he could be a full-time dad, too. If we knew some people who were doing that, and we thought, well, shoot, if they can do it, why not us? And so we started attending seminars. I counted it up once, and it was more than 100 seminars that we attended over the next seven years because we had some friends who could see that our thinking was broken. <laughs> our thinking was keeping us in this place of, you know, at the time we were making about $1,200 between the two of us full-time and struggling to make ends meet at that. But we were investing whatever we could pull together to attend these seminars, $10 here, free seminars there, reading books that were recommended to us. The education that you get does not always have to cost you money. You do what you can do and go as far as you can. And once in a while, investing in something is going to be what you need to do to take the leap and to show that you're ready to receive. There has to be an exchange there of time, energy, or money. But after these seven years, I was so fed up that not enough had changed to make it worth continuing this, this process of going to a seminar, getting on a high, coming down two weeks later, and feeling like we were back to where we were before. And in reality, that's what we were doing. And, and, and these seminars were actually keeping me from spiraling so deep that I couldn't pull out. It was keeping me breathing, if you know what I mean, keeping me going. But along comes another one, and I said, you know, this is the last one. I'm not going to do this anymore. I can't justify the expense. This one was going to cost us a few hundred dollars that we didn't have. We were deep in debt, several tens of thousands of dollars in debt and not affording it. But I just felt so driven to get the education. I knew there was something to these principles. I knew there was something to it because I had seen enough of it to know it works. It had worked for me on occasion. It had worked for helping me find my husband. I'd used the principles there. I knew it. And I was just trying to figure out how to duplicate it again. How do I do it again with our finances? So we went to this seminar, and about halfway through, something clicked. And my husband and I turned to each other, and our mouths dropped open, and we thought, is that really all it is? Is it that simple? And we went home with this new awareness, and within three months, tripled our income. It brought it to over six figures uh, for the first time in our lives, which finally made it so that we could pay off our bills, we could breathe, we could buy the groceries we wanted, and really start to make progress on our future. So I had this breakthrough, and immediately I thought, oh my word, this is simple. It was not as complicated as I was making it all those years. It was like I got a piece of it, a piece of it, a piece of it, and finally the final piece to the puzzle was placed, and I could see the whole picture. And I realized, oh, my word, I cannot stay quiet about this. I decided I needed to start teaching seminars. I needed to start telling people what I had learned. I was one of these people who I thought, it's a whole lot more fun to learn this from somebody who has struggled to figure it out than to learn it from someone who always had it easy. Because I can tell you a 100 ways it doesn't work. 
I can tell you a hundred ways that I tried to make the law of success, the law of attraction, whatever you want to call it. There's actually eight laws that I refer to, seven plus an extra, but like I said, we'll get to those later. And I can tell you how they don't work. And I think that people can find value in that. I know I do. When I meet someone who tried it a hundred times the wrong way, because I try it the wrong way all the time, and I need someone to say, well, okay, here's the minor adjustment. Here's the little adjustment. So in my experience, you know, I talked about those three categories where your setbacks can fall into. All those years fighting a pointless battle for me, I, the broom, you know, I called the police a couple about a year later on a kid who stole cookie dough out of my fridge. And then we had our breakthrough, and I realized that my thinking had had so much to do with it. It only took a minor adjustment. All of those years, I'm grateful for them now because it got me asking the right questions. It got me to the point where I thought, what is wrong with my thinking? What can I just change there? And the second category, knowing better but still failing anyway, like I did with my dog, and God was still able to do something good with it. I'm not going to go around intentionally violating laws because it brings me pain. But when I make mistakes, I know that mistakes aren't fatal. And then the third category is when you set a goal, when you have an intention to accomplish something meaningful, and instead everything starts to fall apart. Well, I told you about our breakthrough where we were able to get on top of our bills. We were able to start making progress. We moved to a nicer home. We were able to get to a place where we were in our dream home. We were making progress. We were living our dream and decided, you know what, it's time to bring my husband home from work. It's time for him to come home and we'll do what we do on our own instead of being employed. We were at a point where we were ready to take that leap. We were actually... uh just to back up a little bit, I had been teaching seminars, but we had a large family and it was still growing and I was feeling spread a little too thin and I thought, I feel guilty if I don't teach this, but I don't have time to keep putting events together. So I decided to write a book. I knew that it couldn't be like all the other books I'd read. It had to be different. It had to create an experience for the reader that would take all these principles out of their head and into their heart where it affects the change because you can think about the laws all day long but until you are feeling them and living them on a on an emotional spiritual level in your heart they don't have the power to create the unseen help that lines things up for you the way the law of attraction is described to do so i wrote this story the jackrabbit factor some of you have maybe heard of it you can get it for free at jackrabbitfactor.com it's a download and the sequel to it because I've learned quite a few things since I wrote that story and I needed to include those in the experience. But I wrote those books and we had this breakthrough and I was going to do a a major run for a New York Times campaign on the book. My husband at the same time, he was seeing deals come across the table that in one transaction would have replaced his entire salary at work and yet he didn't have time to do due diligence on those opportunities because of his work and it just became ridiculous and we realized it's time to take the leap and so we leaped and after about two months everything started to fall apart and it was very scary and we realized that you know here's this third category that setbacks show up after setting a goal properly and we knew we had we knew that our goals had been set properly because we'd been trained in this and we'd been teaching this and we'd seen it work time and time and time and time and time again it's worked for thousands of people and yet everything was falling apart and we weren't expecting that we had unexpected medical issues we had a 1031 exchange go fraudulent on us where tens of thousands of dollars were put aside in a 1031 exchange which is supposed to be a government protected program so that you can roll the profits of one property into another you don't need to understand all this technical stuff if you're not familiar with that But it went fraudulent, and we asked them to return it because we weren't going to be able to take advantage of it. And they said, oh, we're bankrupt. And so that went out the window. Uh, We had several real estate investments that tanked right out from under us. And it threatened to suck the life out of our business, all of these things all at once. You know, and this may not be a big deal to you, but to us living in Arizona, this is a big, huge deal. Our air conditioner was broken for about six weeks out of the summer. It wasn't that, you know, it, we had warranty on them, but the warranty company, we'd make an appointment to have them come fix it, and it would take a week for them to get here. They'd fix it, they'd leave, it would break, and it would take them another week to get back. And so for six weeks out of the summer, when we're, we're hitting 110, 115 degree weather, 
we have a family with seven children and no air conditioning. And it was all we could do to keep our attitude uh, in, in place through all of these things going wrong and at the same time trying to live the principles we were teaching. You know, I remember one day jumping out into the pool with my clothes on. I jumped in the pool with all my clothes on. I walked in the house dripping wet. I went up to my office. I sat down, and I just sat there dripping wet to work because I knew that it would evaporate so fast there would be no damage to any of our furniture or anything, and that's the way I stayed cool, I should say. So this was what we were facing, and I thought, what are we doing wrong? Why has everything gone wrong when it's supposed to go right? I'm thinking right. I know I am because I teach this and we've experienced this. Why is it that right now it seems that all of the laws are suspended for us? It's working for everybody else who's applying these principles except us. And I started asking some pretty serious questions, not knowing what was going on or what we were going to do. And then the challenge to top all challenges, I'm up in my office and I'm sitting there and from downstairs I hear my son who was seven six or seven at the time, he yelled, Mom, Bethany's lips are blue. And my heart stopped. And I ran downstairs. I don't think I touched a single stair all the way down. And I ran outside to the pool. And my eight-year-old son had pulled my daughter, who was three at the time, out of the pool, and she was unconscious. And I came to her side, and she was laying there. And her heart was stopped. She wasn't breathing, and, and her lips indeed were blue. And I was numb. The whole world stopped in that moment. And I picked her up, and I draped her over my knee like I did with my infants, and I patted her back like, like, like she was choking or something, you know. You do that when, you're, when your child is choking on something. You tip them over, and you pat their back. Well, she was lifeless, absolutely lifeless. Of course, she wasn't choking. She had drowned. And I tipped her over, and I, I let her, I, I put her back down on the deck, and her head hit the deck too hard. So I I made the mistake of patting her on the back. That was wrong. I did the wrong thing. It didn't do any good. I let her head hit the deck too hard. And if she had been awake, if she had been, if she had been there, her, she would have complained that her head hurt and there was no response. How I wished that she could have responded in that moment. So I, I, I thought, okay, she needs oxygen to her brain. And I gave her mouth to mouth. Or I tried to fill her lungs and it didn't work. It came rushing out her nose. I made another mistake. It was wrong. I did the wrong thing. But because I made that mistake and I saw the, the, the breath rush out her nose, I was able to plug her nose the next time, and I gave her a breath, and it filled her chest, and it sat there. And I thought, well, that is it, just sitting there. And I thought, well, the oxygen is in her lungs. It needs to get to her brain. I can do that by, by pumping her heart. And so I pumped her heart. I had had CPR training 15 years before, but I didn't remember it. All I was going off was instinct that air had to be in her lungs, the blood had to deliver the oxygen to her brain, and her and her heart wasn't pumping. I had to do that myself. So I did that, another round of oxygen, another round of compressions, and her eyes started to flutter, and she started to breathe. And she didn't come back right away. She didn't come back all the way. She she seized up like she was having a seizure. And I held her, and I and, and all the time this is going on, my other children are standing around watching and they're they're crying and they're panicked and I yelled to my older daughter I said call 911 call 911 and she froze and I yelled at her until she finally ran inside and so by the time she started coming to she started breathing on her own I carried her inside and my daughter was on the phone with the paramedics and they were on their way they came and by this time she was breathing on her own she was fine she was responding she could she knew who she was and they told me that this outcome was rare. We don't know how long she had been in the in the pool. We don't know how long that she had been there. But she stayed the night in the hospital. And she came home completely well. And I am grateful for that. And where I should have been just full of gratitude and happiness, I wasn't feeling that. I was feeling like I'd been hit by a truck. After everything we'd already been through, and this too, you know, there are certain lessons to be learned from an experience like that. For one thing, that was an experience that I had always feared. And I'm not saying that 
you know, it's natural to fear those things, and you don't want to get worked up that if you're fearing it, you might be creating it. I'm not going to go there. But I look at that one as God giving me an opportunity to face that fear and learn some things. Now, yes, of course, there are the obvious shallow lessons of, oh, be more watchful of your children. You know what? I am so grateful that not a single person felt like they needed to tell me that one. That's obvious. Okay? We make mistakes. And I just hope that you never feel judgmental towards anyone who goes through something like this. But another more, maybe a deeper lesson is that life is precious and that nothing matters but that our family's intact. You know, and that's a meaningful lesson. I can't tell you how angelic the rest of my children were with each other for the next couple days. Everybody was just so grateful that we were still a whole family. But then it was while I was creating a home study program on these principles that I was trying to wrap up the ending and my husband said, you know, just go away to a hotel or something until you're finished with it because we were finding it difficult to complete it. It really required a lot of focus and I, I needed to look inward and find how this needed to end. But I was away and it was a few months after this experience with my daughter that I was in the hotel room and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I finally saw with 2020 vision exactly what that lesson was meant to be. That life delivered that experience for me for a very, very specific reason. And when I saw it, everything changed. Everything about our finances, everything that I had been going through, I could see it with new eyes. And that is this. I made, I can count, at least four mistakes in trying to keep my daughter well. First mistake, not being more watchful. Second mistake, patting her on the back as though she were choking. Third mistake, letting her head hit the deck too hard. Fourth mistake, giving her mouth to mouth without plugging her nose. Now, every one of those moments created a result that was not what I was after. Every one of those moments resulted in the reality being not what I wanted it to be. Look at your life the way it is right now. If it's not what you want it to be, you may be feeling like, you know, I'm a failure. I didn't avoid this or that or I didn't make that decision there or I didn't prepare better for this. Whatever it was that put you where you are right now, it may have been the actions of others. It doesn't matter what it was, but whatever it is, how foolish would it have been for me to sit in my office and hear my son say, Bethany's lips are blue, and me sit there and say, oh, man, I blew it. Why did life happen this way? Is God not aware of me? Are my prayers even passing through the ceiling? Why does this always happen to me? How come nothing ever goes my way? How foolish would it have been for me to sit in that chair and even think thoughts like that for two seconds? There wasn't time to think about any of that. I was out the door. And how foolish would it have been when I gave her the breath and it rushed out her nose for me to say, oh, man, I guess this won't work. Nothing ever goes my way. I can't succeed. I've tried so many times. I've tried. I've tried and I've tried and i tried and it never, look, it didn't work. How foolish would it have been for me to stop and do that for even two seconds? There wasn't time to do that. There was no time. And so with every failure, with every setback, with every mistake, I had a decision to make. There wasn't time to bemoan my failures. There wasn't time for any of that because each second counted. And what I learned from that experience was that every one of those setbacks, every failure, is nothing more than feedback. Hitting her head on the deck didn't wake her up. That's feedback. That's nothing but data. Giving her mouth to mouth and having it rush out her nose, nothing but data. It's just feedback. It's not a failure. It's feedback. And if life isn't showing up the way you think it should, it's just feedback. And so long as you have breath to give, it's not too late to revive your finances. And that's what I learned from this experience with my daughter And it made me look at our finances in another way. It's hard to explain how we were feeling at that time. But if you're on this call, you probably know. 
you just feel defeated. You feel tired. You feel like I can't go one more step. I can't keep doing this. I can't. I can't. But if you're still breathing, you can. You can take one more step. And that's all you're required to take. You're only required to just try one more thing. Just one more thing. You still have breath to give. It's not too late. But the longer you bemoan your failures, the longer you sit around and are upset about the way things are, you're risking long-term financial handicap. My daughter came through without brain damage, but it's because I didn't sit around and entertain negative thoughts. There was no time. All I could do was go to her with the intention of seeing her well, and you can bet I was praying too, and I'm grateful those prayers were answered. But I didn't have time to run through the images in my mind of what's going to happen if she's a vegetable. There was no time to do that. I saw her well, and I went to work. Look at your finances. Stop seeing them as handicapped, stop seeing them as on their deathbed, stop seeing them as flat, see them well, see them well, and keep trying. God's not going to let you keep trying to the point of it never works. He hasn't brought you this far to fail now. And you know what? That's a phrase that I repeated to myself quite often, and I had my husband tell me that quite often. He'd say, honey, he hasn't brought us this far to fail now. There's still something more we can do. What is that that we can do today? What can we do today? You know, and if if bills are screaming at you, if you've got creditors calling you, don't avoid them. Face them. Just face them and say, look, this is what's going on. This is what we're trying to do. Do what you need to do. You know, if you end up losing everything through this process, but if you learn certain lessons that allow you to rebuild bigger and better, then you can look ahead 10 years from now. Do you think you're really going to still be in this situation in 10 years? It may be it may be some weeks, it may be some months before things turn around. But start focusing 10 years from now. Start getting the vision of where you're really going. That's spotting the rabbit. Read Jackrabbit Factor so you know what I mean by that. Spot the rabbit so you'll know which way to jump and bark. Now, let me quickly get to what I want to share with you. You need to have your pencil ready and a piece of paper because I'm going to teach you something. It's elementary, but it really boiled down for me into one simple, beautiful package of truth to help me understand how these principles work so that we could effectively, in three months, triple our income that time. And by the way, we've used this process again and again and again to overcome challenges and to achieve our goals. And when we set goals, challenges come. I'm not going to say that you learn these principles and it's going to be rosy for the rest of your life. No, but it gives you the tool to overcome anything. So I want you to draw a circle on your paper about the size of a quarter, and I want you to put a horizontal line through the center of it. Now, at the bottom of the circle, I want you to draw a little a little stick, uh, maybe a centimeter long, and then a smaller circle under that. And then put four little arms and legs. This is a this is a little stick person with a big head and a line going through the center of his head. Now, on the top, I want you to label the top half. You might want to just draw an arrow to it. Label that the conscious mind. This is the conscious part of your mind. This this particular diagram I have in a video for free online, so I'll be able to tell you where that is, too. If I forget to tell you, I'll tell you how to, you know, I will be giving you my contact information at the end so you can ask me where it is. But this is the conscious part of your mind. Now, draw an arrow to the bottom half of the the bottom hemisphere of that larger circle, that's the subconscious part of your mind. And, of course, the little circle is your body. Now, coming out to the right of your body, I want you to draw an arrow pointing to the right. And at the end of that arrow, I want you to write the word results. So let me just kind of go over this again. You've got a larger circle with a horizontal line. The top is your conscious. The bottom is your subconscious. The little circle at the bottom is your body, and out to the right of your body is an arrow pointing to the word results. Now, I want you to put the letter X in your subconscious mind. And then I want you to put an X out next to the word results. 
James Allen puts it beautifully. He wrote a book about 150 years ago called As a Man Thinketh. And he says that the outer conditions, so these X results, the outer conditions of a man's life will always be found to be harmoniously related to his inner state. Men do not attract that which they want, but that which they are. And the subconscious part of your mind, you know, that's, that's, I want you to also look at that as your heart. That's where your heart, uh, your emotions. Now, here's why we remain in bondage. Okay, so if you have an idea in the subconscious part of your mind that says, you know, things are always hard, or there's never enough money, we're always broke, that might be a subconscious idea that's down there running these programs that are controlling your outcomes, whether you like it or not and whether you know it or not. Notice that arrow coming out from the body, that represents action. And it's your body that takes the action, but it's your subconscious mind that controls your results. And I think you might be able to see how this works. Imagine if you're, if you're dieting. You can manipulate, you know, what you put in your mouth. You can exercise. These are all body activities. But if you have a program in your subconscious mind that sees yourself as overweight and that that's just the way you are, then no matter what you do on a physical level, your subconscious mind will ultimately take over and put you right back to where it believes you are comfortable. And let me explain why it does this. Your subconscious mind is designed to keep you safe. That's what it's designed to do. It's the part that keeps your heart beating all day long. It's the part that keeps you breathing through the night. And thank heavens it does that because if I had to put it on my checklist to remember to keep my heart beating, I probably wouldn't still be here. So the subconscious mind is a good thing. It's a good thing. It keeps you safe. And it has certain beliefs about you. Whatever is the status quo, it considers to be safe. It's what it thinks is what you need for your survival. So if it sees yourself as overweight, it believes that's what's safe. And if we want to really change the results, then we've got to change the program running instead of trying to just manipulate what we do. And the same thing with our success. If you're running a business or if you're looking for a job and you have a subconscious program that says nobody's hiring, there's never any work, nobody wants me, whatever it might be, then you can go say all the right things in the interview. You can shake his hand with firmness like they teach you. You can speak and look at him directly in the eye and say all the right things. But if there's a subconscious part of you that says, this isn't going to work out, they will pick up on it subconsciously and you won't get the job. Now let me tell you how to change this. And again, this is a a real brief, brief five-minute explanation of the stick person if you stick with me and on my i'm going to invite you how to get to my onto my email list i'll show you where to watch the whole video it's 90 minutes it goes into this much deeper uh, at no charge but now i want you to draw another stick man below we're going to do some different images on it different pictures with it and up to the left i want you to draw a cloud over his head this is where he has a new idea and i want you to put y in the cloud the letter y That's creating a new idea. That's picturing the outcome that you want instead of the one you're trying to avoid. Now put the why in the conscious part of the mind. That's what you're doing when you're thinking about it. You're trying to think, huh, would that, I wonder if I really could have that job. What would that be like? Could I see myself being there? Could I, you know, what would it be like to, who would I be working with? It's just thinking about it. It's running it through your conscious mind. And then when you can answer the question and write this down, what will it feel like when? What will it feel like when dot, dot, dot? When you can answer that question, and the answer to that question is an emotion. So you have to answer that question with an emotion that you feel. You don't just say, oh, that would feel great. You've got to feel it. And so what you're doing is you're going to allow yourself to get emotionally involved with that idea. If you can answer the question, man, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to picture myself driving to that job because it's my job now and I'm going to be walking through the doors. How's that going to feel? How's it going to feel to come home that day and say, honey, the first day went awesome. How's that going to feel? If you can feel that, if you can allow yourself to daydream until it becomes emotional, 
even on a small level, then you have successfully planted the idea in your subconscious mind. Go ahead and put a Y down there next to the X in the subconscious. Now, one of the laws of, of success is called the law of vibration. A lot of people refer to it as the law of attraction, but it's more accurately called the law of vibration. And let me tell you why. If I have a radio here in the room and I want to listen to classical and I turn on the station and I hear country, it's not going to pick up on the classical until I tune the dial, until I turn the dial and tune in to the station that's broadcasting classical. If I can make it play classical, would I say, oh, the radio attracted classical? Did it suck the classical music into the room? No. Did it draw the classical music to it? No. It tuned into it. The classical was already there. It just resonated with it because it was on the same frequency. So the law of attraction is more the law of vibration. We all are in a state of vibration, and our emotions are just, you know, like if we feel good, then we're just consciously aware that we're in a positive vibration. And the object here is to become in a vibration that's in harmony with the circumstance that you really want. If you want abundance, you have to be in a vibration of abundance. And you do that with this process by picturing it on the screen of your mind, what abundance would look like in your life, and then putting it in the subconscious by allowing yourself to feel how it would feel if it were a part of your life. If you're a praying kind of person, like I am, it's the difference between praying for help to pay your bills while picturing the disaster at the end of the month that will happen if there is no money versus praying for help with the bills while picturing yourself joyfully paying those bills. Do you see the difference? I believe that God is the creator of the universe and that the laws governing the universe handle everything. When the apple breaks from the tree, God doesn't have to rush over and push it down. The laws handle it. And just the same way with these laws of success. I don't believe he sits up there on a throne and has packages of blessings that he says, oh, I think I'll send some of those that way, and I'll send some of those that way. I believe that these things naturally become a part of our lives when we are in harmony with those laws that govern the universe. They're already all around us, just like classicals already in the room, and they resonate with us. The ideas, the opportunities that will get us what we're looking for will resonate with us when we are in tune with them. We change our vibration by picturing it on the screen of our mind, allowing ourselves to feel it and get emotionally involved with it. Now, there is a, another part to this. that Notice how there is an X and a Y in the subconscious mind. If there is an X in the subconscious mind, by law, our body automatically moves into an X vibration. Well, if we are successful at planting the Y idea in our subconscious mind, then it also automatically moves our body into a Y vibration. But that's problematic because what if X says, I am always broke, and Y says, I live abundantly? Those are two contradictory truths that have been accepted by the subconscious mind. Subconscious cannot distinguish the difference between truth and what's false. It just accepts it to be true. It's our conscious mind and the filter that keep us from either accepting an idea, like if I were to tell you, you can have abundance. That horizontal line is a filter. You're either saying no and rejecting it with your filter, or you're saying, I wonder if that could be true. If you allow yourself to consider it on an emotional level and if it resonates with the core person that you are, the core of who you are, then you know it's good, you know it's right, and it can be yours. And the staying in that vibration will make it so that when you're in the elevator standing next to that person, something inside of you will just be drawn or compelled to say hello because perhaps that person is who you need to talk to to lead you to the right person who's got the right opportunity that you're looking for. You know, it's these little, little transactions that lead you to the thing that you're looking for. And these little transactions only take place if you're in the right vibration to resonate with them. So when you're feeling an X vibration and a Y vibration, you know, on the subconscious level, on the emotional level, it's going to feel good. But when you go to take action, that contradiction going on is going to feel like anxiety. So when an opportunity comes along that's in harmony with what you're trying to do, you're going to feel it, that it's right. But when you go to do it, you're going to feel sick. And it's not because it's wrong. It's because you've got two contradictory truths wrestling with each other, one that says, I'm always broke, one that's trying to contend with that by saying, I have abundance and I'm getting ready to claim it. And in that moment, when you feel anxiety, you get to choose 
to look at it as a bad thing or as a sign that you're almost there. And that is what my husband and I did when we tripled our income in three months. An opportunity came along that terrified us, but we knew in our gut that it was the right thing to do. And in my husband's case, people always want to know, what was it, what was it? He had a job opportunity come along that was going to triple his monthly income, but it was guaranteed for only three months. Would you take it? No benefits? Scary thing, but we knew it was the right thing to do. And we did it, and that three-month contract turned into about two years and got us to a point where we were able to leave his employment by choice with enough cushion to uh, give us a chance to get on our feet. So the opportunity will come. I promise you that. It's a law. This is how it works. You do these things, the opportunity will come. And when you feel that anxiety, instead of looking at it like, oh, I'm going to go back to my comfort zone, thank you, I'd rather be miserable, you look at it and say, oh, I've got to do this. I've just got to do this and trust that the laws are going to support me. So we're just about done. We've got about nine minutes left. But anytime you come to a class like this, I believe every class like this should have a call to action. I don't want you going away saying, oh, that was nice. I want you to do something. You've got to take action. You've got to do something in order for this to become a part of you. And, you know, I didn't get a chance to go over the laws and have 19 rules of prosperity that I'd like to cover with you. But instead of going through it right here and now because there's not time, I want you to write this down. I want you to go to Portal to Genius, Portal to Genius, P-O-R-T-A-L-T-O-G-E-N-I-U-S dot com and click on free report. That's it. That's your call to action. I want you to make sure you go do that if you haven't done it already. That is where you're going to see the 19 principles of prosperity that you can find out right now which ones, if any, that you violate regularly. When I looked at these principles, I thought, oh, my word. Yeah, I'm doing that one wrong. Oh, I'm doing that one wrong. I'm doing that one wrong. And I'm not here to say that doing them right is easy, but it makes life easier. So you can either have life hard (laughs) or you can learn to abide these principles and you'll find out that it's easier. I want you to think about a gear. Imagine yourself as a gear that's turning and it has the teeth on the edges. And you want this gear to move over into an area of the massive clock or machinery that is the success area. And there are other gears that come along to spin you and move you and take you there. But most often, our natural tendency is something comes along, life comes along, and this gear engages with the teeth on our gear, and it grinds. And we're like, no, I don't want to move. I won't go there. And it grinds and it rubs and there's friction and it's painful. But if we just relax and we let it move us, we let it turn us, we let it change us and take us there, then we go and we end up in the successful place we want to be. Now, that's it. That's your call to action. PortalToGenius.com, free report. Thank you for being with us tonight. Now, there is one other thing I'd like to mention, but it will only apply, honestly, probably to about seven or eight people who are on the call tonight. I know there was, last I checked, there were nearly 300 registrants who signed up for this call. This is not for everyone. So I I just want you to know that for those of you who came for this class, we're done. But if you want to stick around, if you think you may be one of these people, I created an intensive 12-week program to walk you through two phases. The first where I take you through an experience where you'll see an absolute and direct connection between your thoughts and your results with something trivial. Something like finding a lost set of car keys. (laughs) And then during phase two, I help you create an experience where you accomplish something not so trivial, something that wrestles, that wrestles with your subconscious programs, that, that challenges them. And once you see the process work on these two different levels, you have the pattern for accomplishing every goal you want to achieve during your lifetime. Now, this 12 week program, it's not for everyone, and it's certainly not for the faint of heart. But if you think you may be ready for this level of training, stick around just a little longer. Otherwise, you're free to go. Thank you again for coming, and don't forget to get your free report at portaltogenius.com. Now, for those of you who have decided to stick around a little longer, I'd like you to write this down. prosperyourfamily.com, P-R-O-S-P-E-R-Y-O-U-R-F-A-M-I-L-Y.com. That page is going to answer every question you might have about this 12-week program. And if you decide to sign up, I'll be working with you individually on your goal statement at the midterm. 
Now, keep in mind that if you were to hire me for personal mentoring, you'll pay anywhere from $199, which this service is generally going to cost, on up to $12,000, which is nothing compared to what you can create with this knowledge. That's something that we created the first month that we really made this work. And it's really nothing compared to the $150,000 that we've paid our mentors over the years to teach us what I will share with you in the 12-week program for about half a percent of that. So if you're listening, you know, it's likely that your recent setbacks happened so that you'd end up on this call tonight. I hope you feel like you've gained something that's going to help you move forward. Take one more step. Take one more breath and breathe life into your condition. You've still got breath to give, so you can do it. This could be the turning point for you. The 12-week program will show you why the life you want is closer than you know. It's, it's like in the room, like the classical music, it's that close. Let me show you how to start living with financial peace of mind in any economy, even this one. And even if you're at rock bottom, you're still breathing. It's not too late to revive your finances. Let me show you how. Prosperyourfamily.com. With that, thank you again for joining us. If this opportunity does not resonate with you, don't worry about it. And don't forget to get your free report at portaltogenius.com. Remember, what you do with this setback determines what your life will look like just months from now. It begins with a mindset, and I look forward to helping you with it. If you have questions, I can be reached at portaltogenius.com. There's a contact page there if you have questions about that. Otherwise, uh, we're going to wrap it up. There are two more minutes. I'm going to open the line. If you have any questions, I'll hang around for a few more minutes. I want to thank you, and God bless you for I've never heard anything that resonated so much to some of my experience and beliefs in life. Thank you for being here. Are you going to have something later on in the year? If you go download the free report, you'll be notified of anything else I'm doing. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Leslie, now. you were awesome. Thank you so much. You had mentioned the name of a book that you yes. wrote. Yes, The Jackrabbit Backdoor. And you can download that free from Portal to Genius as well. Okay, if I can't download it, can I buy it somewhere? Yeah, it's at Amazon. It's at our website. Okay, thanks a lot. You take care of yourself. Thank you. Leslie, hi. I had a question in that money aside, it sounds like all of your uh, lessons have been not about money. Is that more or less true, that your experiences lead you to have some greater knowing that's not necessarily about the money, but like you with your daughter, that resonated really big with me because it was a lesson about something else, yeah. about knowing of, of, I would say, God. And that's what I find is that none of the lessons are ever about money. They're always about a truth about me and life and God. And then now finding you, it's the glimpse into how I can turn all this that I know into the prosperity. So yes. I was just wondering if that is what you find. Absolutely. And if you read the rest of my story at prosperyourfamily.com, you'll, yeah. you'll see that. You'll see that. It is so, you know, and in my life, I came to this knowledge because of money challenge. There are other people that come to this knowledge through health challenges. So you'll see my, my lessons, they talk about money, but really it's finding that peace of mind because when you're in peace of mind and you're aligned with, with who you are and what you're here to do, then the money flows. Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct. It's a mm -hmm. byproduct. Well, I thank you so much. Thank you. One of the um, the items you talked about as far as reasons for setbacks was um, when they show up as a result of you being solidly on track and accomplishing something amazing. Yeah. And that has happened to me a couple times, at least twice in my business ventures where right on the cusp of signing a big contract and moving into a major prosperity flow and all hell breaks loose. Yep. And I was wondering what was going on with that. Yeah, are you asking that or are you saying you you know? Well, I like what you said that, you know, the subconscious, somewhere in the subconscious I have not been, I think what I had been doing is holding on to too much of the struggle, hard work, lack emotion. Uh -huh. And so even when all the stuff that I did in the physical world started to pay off, Emotionally and visually, I wasn't in tune, in tuned with the prosperity that was right there for me. Does that make sense? To you? Oh, absolutely. It's it's a, it's a common process. I mean, you've just described what everybody 
is facing or will face if they if they plan on reaching their highest potential. And and when those things happen, it it's a gift. It's your opportunity to practice these principles in the face of disaster because that is how you earn the reward. That is how you prove yourself that you are that new person who is ready to receive it. It means nothing to practice these principles of right thinking when everything's going well. How easy is that? Everybody can do that. Right. When you're right there ready to capture the prosperity, you know, when you're right there at the edge of it and all hell breaks loose, that is a gift to you. It is an opportunity for you to practice these thinking principles, these to, to look at it right. For example, when something like this happens to us, and it happens regularly because we're on purpose, we're headed somewhere. And so these challenges show up, and every one of them becomes a stepping stone that puts us in a position to receive an amazing breakthrough that wouldn't have been received had we not gone through the challenge. So the challenge, it's when we're in the middle of it, and it's horrible, and we're hating it. When we can stop, and if you're if you're doing this on your own, you can do it with yourself. Just say, take a deep breath, and you say, I don't know why this is here. But I am grateful for it because it means something awesome is just this close. And right there, you have shifted your vibration. Right Ah, there. That's how simple. That is how simple it can be. That's powerful. I've never done it that way. I used to get upset when it happened. Oh, that's the natural thing to do. Can you say that again? Okay. (laughs) Let Let me give you a picture that will help you remember this. Imagine you are a child who doesn't know how to swim. And say someone throws you into the water, the deep water, because they know that you'll figure it out if you want it bad enough, right? Hmm? So you you get thrown in, and what's your immediate reaction? Panic. Panic. Do you tense up? Yeah. And what happens when you tense up and panic in water? You go down. You go down. down. So what do you have to do? If you want to learn how to swim, if you want to teach someone how to swim, what do you have to teach them first? Relax. Relax. Teach them to float. And how you float is you take a deep breath, get oxygen to your brain so you can keep thinking, take a deep breath, keep your chin up, and you will float. And you do that when your finances are falling apart. You keep your chin up. You take a deep breath. You relax. Stay relaxed because it's only in a relaxed state that the solutions you need are going to reach you. Wow. Your mind mind has to stay clear. And you can only keep your mind clear if you're not in panic mode or anger mode. You've got to stay in alignment with these principles. If you can take a deep breath and be at peace, then then you'll get these flashes of inspiration that won't be there unless you can be in that place. Now, two movies kind of illustrate this. There's one of the Harry Potter movies. I don't even remember which one. The children are in this room of snaky octopusy arms. And the more they fight it, the more tight it strangles them. Until one of them discovers that if they just relax, the arms relax, and they slip through the bottom into an empty room below. When you're stressing, you can't, it it tightens around you. You have to relax, and it will relax around you. And the the second movie is Jodie Foster in Contact. She's in this this wormhole traveling. She's strapped to a chair that's vibrating violently. Finally, she realizes her necklace has shaken loose, and it's floating in front of her just peacefully. And she unstraps herself from the chair, and she floats. And she looks around, and the chair is violently shaking, and it finally rattles loose. And she realizes she didn't have to be fighting it so much. She could just let go, and it would carry her. That's fantastic, because it just dawned on me that all those challenges were not coming from the outside. They were coming from my subconscious being afraid to move on into that level of prosperity. It was me. It wasn't anything else, right? Well, I'm glad you're saying that with a smile on your face. When I <laughs> figured it out, I was depressed. I'm like, oh, man. But, you know, I knew what I could do about it, and that, was, that made all the difference. What Do you have a few examples of what you might say when you're really gripped by that, I mean, intense fear, panic? I mean, yeah. I'm not rational in those moments, and I don't even – and the thoughts just don't come to calm myself down that have any effect. I, what do you say? I go to my eight laws reference list, and this mm-hmm. is something that's a part of the 12-week course. One of the laws is the law of polarity, that every negative situation, everything negative has an equal positive. Positive. 
Mm-hmm. And so if something is horrific in your life, then on the other side of it is something amazing, and it's more amazing than the little irritating thing <laughs> has to offer. <laughs> so, like, if you stub your toe, that's awful. But the good thing on the other side of that is nothing like the reward that comes from getting through cancer or, you know, something huge. So the worse it is, the better it is. Yeah. Something really, really bad shows up. My husband and I will look at each other and say, wow, this must be awesome. That's yeah. absolutely true. I was injured in the line of duty as a police officer and reneged on my disability. and I got in a financial hole with no medical coverage and medical bills and it's been a financial nightmare out on the IRS and the foreclosures and everything else and just fighting for justice. And now I guess what I see now is maybe I, I need to look at maybe a, a different, try to look at a different perspective. I always thought that I just have to endure to keep the battle going to, to patience and perseverance and persistence like Jesus says and eventually it'll, it'll win in the end or something good will come out of it anyway. If not, even if I don't win, there'll be other blessings in it. Yeah, Bob Proctor was our mentor for many years, and it did me a world of good. I, you know, I'd look at him like, man, he can he can make anything happen in his life. He's just amazing. I had him on a pedestal, and one day I was in a room with him, and he he said, you know, the strangest thing happened. He says I was I was getting up this morning, and I was in the shower, and I reached down and I hit my head on the soap dish. I'm like, ah, you know. Wow, that hurt. And and then later he was brushing his teeth and he hit his head on the shelf above the mirror or next to the mirror. And he rubbed his head and he's like, man, you know, everything happens for a reason. Why did I attract this pain into my life? And he started analyzing it. And then he was on his way to the meeting and he missed his plane. He's like, man, I wonder what that happened for. Why did that happen? And Now, that's nothing like what you're talking about. But what he said about it, he said, as I was pondering why these things were happening to me, he remembered that he had been asking a question in his mind, uh, trying to understand at a deeper level the difference between responding versus reacting. And he says, here I was pondering the difference, trying to understand it on a deeper level, and what did life provide? Life delivered three opportunities for me to try to respond instead of react. Because the only way you really learn these lessons is to experiment when they're happening. And another thing that he told us was when he was first learning these principles, he was a fireman, and he was in a room with, I believe, Earl Nightingale, I think was who was talking to him at the time. And uh, he was looking around the room, and he says, Bob, you are the luckiest man in the room. And Bob looked around, and he thought he was insane because he was the worst off. He was broke. His life was miserable. He was hanging out at the bars. He just was not in a good place in his life, and he was miserable about it. And here, Earl Nightingale, and don't quote me on that. It was either Earl or um, it might have been Vic Conant. I can't remember. But he pointed at him, and he says, you are the luckiest man in the room. And he finally said, well, why? He says, because you have the greatest opportunity for growth. The person who has it the hardest, by applying these principles, has the greatest opportunity for huge, huge reward, even here in this life, before you get to the other side. Because of the things you learn and because of the kind of contribution you'll make showing other people how to do this. You know, would you rather learn these things from someone who had it easy in life or from someone who had no limbs? (laughs) Have you seen Vic Vachukic? I can't say his name. He's the man without limbs. You can look him up on Google. He has no arms. He has no legs. And he is successful. He is wealthy. He is successful. And he has impacted thousands and millions of people's lives. He goes into school and he talks to the youth. And they come away from that realizing, man, I thought my life was pretty bad. But look how happy he is. And you become an example to others. And there is no greater satisfaction than being able to impact other people that way. So if you've got it bad, count yourself fortunate. You have the best opportunity. You've got the tools. You've got the knowledge or you're beginning to get the knowledge. You'll be led to every piece of knowledge you need to turn this around. And you can have the abundance. You can have the ideal life, but you need to start picturing it and imagining how it's going to feel and not wondering if it will. Thank you, and I believe in that. But my biggest frustration is that when I was a police officer, I worked in a highway safety unit. I'm an expert in traffic crashes and traffic safety. 
and I have knowledge and expertise that I share with the public. I go into schools and I help teach teenagers uh, how to protect themselves on the highways from the number one cause of death to all people in the United States at the age of 35, driving. And my frustration is that I do this a lot at pro bono, but, and, and I can't get the message out fast enough. I'm in this battle with one hand tied behind my back. I'm in a boat, and there's people in the water drowning up in front of me, and I can't get to them fast enough because my boat's sinking financially because I have to go over here and keep bailing it out before I can get there. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate I appreciate that, and it's and this is what I'm talking about. How there are times where I feel like like you that I can't get the message out fast enough. What I do, and something in the back of my head keeps reminding me: you don't have to run faster than you have strength. Nobody is going to miss what you need to tell them because you will be able to reach them at the right time. If you can't reach them now, it's because it's not the right time to reach them, and you need to relax about that. Don't worry about that because it's in that panic that I'm not doing it fast enough that that's cutting you off from the source of the flow. Ah, okay, because i got the emotional connection because I've seen all the horror on our highways. I know the reality that I'm going to try to prevent that, including my own loved ones driving out there. So take a deep breath and just say, what can I do in the next five minutes? And only do that. You don't have to do tomorrow's work today. Do today's work today and do it your best. And day by day, you're going to be led in the right direction to do everything that you are meant to do for these people. And nobody will miss it if you stay in that, that trust. Stay Thank you so much, Leslie. And I keep reminding myself, that Williams had a quote many years ago, that all I can do is all I can do, and all I can do is enough. That gives me some peace. I live by that. I live by that. And, you know, one of the things that I've put near the end of my new Portal to Genius book is that, You have everything you need right now to do what you need to do. If you don't have what you think you need, you don't really need it. Do what you can with what you have, and you'll find out that it was enough. Awesome. So, good. Thanks for hanging around. I enjoy talking about this stuff. I just wanted to say one last thing. I'm just thinking about my own life, and I'm thinking, like, if my subconscious mind is so powerful to cause so much havoc and chaos (laughs) that it has caused me (laughs) trauma, then creating, then... It should be a cakewalk for my subconscious to be able to create peace and prosperity and abundance if it's been able to do all those negative things so easily. Absolutely. Absolutely. And your challenge is the mental toughness. That's what you've got to take control over the thoughts you entertain. And you know you'll have your bad days, but listen to this. And because you guys are staying long, you get this really cool morsel, is that if you have a bad day and you rant and rave and you think, oh, I blew it, Okay, in that moment, you can think, oh, I blew it, or do what I do and say, man, I blew it. Okay, I'll try to do better. Dear God, please make up for where I fell short. He makes up for our our shortcomings if we ask him. Because in that moment, I can say, oh, I guess I blew it. And if I hold that thought, it becomes true. And if that's not what I want, I can choose instead, oh, I had a bad day. You know what? We all have bad days. I think my goal is still coming. I think I'll still succeed. And because I think that way, I do. Mm -hmm. Amazing. You were awesome tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. I just want to wish you luck, and I'm going to look into your programs. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie. question? Yes. But that program, you said that there was going to be an upcoming one. What's the cost, please? Uh, The upcoming program? Yes. I'm not sure what you mean. We have a 12-week home study program. Sorry, that same 12-week home study. That's what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, it's a box that comes in the mail. It's a 300-page manual with 24 lessons and a DVD and a whole bunch of stuff. So that is at prosperyourfamily.com. Big, long page that tells our story. Just scroll to the bottom if you want to get to the purchase link. Okay. Thank you very much. You see, You're welcome. I don't want to sound too repetitious, but I'm a person that has been exposed to this sort of training, all right, and um, I see where you are extremely, extremely good at what you're doing, and I just want to wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. And That's the kind of repetition I'll take all day long. <laughs> <laughs> all right, were... Leslie. I can help a lot of people with what I do. I'm just very shy and scared to talk to people. Yeah. But every time I get close to finding someone, 
something happens, either I have to look after my niece, a family emergency, something's always holding me back and I don't understand it, other than I know that I can help a lot of people. In that moment when something gets in the way, find gratitude. To say, I know that everything's working out for a purpose and I believe the people who can benefit from what I have to give are being lined up. And if it's not now, it'll be at the right time, and I still look forward to it. Just do not let those things get oh. you thinking that it won't happen. Don't let any evidence let you think otherwise. Okay. In fact, you can say, oh, well, because I have to watch my knees, maybe that's going to make it so that I end up meeting somebody I wouldn't have met before. And you keep just believe that everything is working out for you. Stay in that belief. It does. This concludes today's episode of the Rare Faith Podcast. You've been listening to Leslie Householder, author of The Jackrabbit Factor, Portal to Genius, and Hidden Treasures, Heaven's Astonishing Help with Your Money Matters. All three books can be downloaded free at a rarekindoffaith.com. So tell your friends and join Leslie again next time as she goes even deeper into the principles that will help you change your life.